Please be seated. The court is now in session. To continue hearing testimony of expert David Chandler, I now hand over to Judge Kadrai to continue her questions to this witness. Thank you, President. Uh, Professor Schaeffer, in the book Pol Pot Plans the Future, there is a, a document which you introduced and translated, uh, document number four, uh, and it is uh, clearly identified as being from a speech or paper by Pol Pot himself. Uh, the um, title of the um, uh, document is Preliminary explanation before reading the plan by the party secretary, and it's sourced at the party centre, 21 August 1976. In the um, <clears throat> preface to the book, uh, it was said that this speech was given at a meeting of the centre in August of 1976. And you say at uh, English ERN 00104057, between 21 and 23 August 1976, at a meeting of the Centre, not otherwise specified, but probably consisting of a select group of CPK members assembled in Phnom Penh, the Party Secretary Pol Pot spoke at length about the party's four-year plan. The speech itself runs to 65 pages, so I'm not expecting you to have memorized it, uh, but there is in it a discussion of the originality of the Cambodian Revolution, the speed at which socialism must be built because of attacks from the East and the West, the speech also uh, uh, seeks to justify that uh, goals for greatly increased rice production were realistic. Do you recall this document in general? Yes, I do. Now, at that meeting, there were um, members, uh, there were CPK members other than uh, the group you have referred to as a select group of CPK members. And uh, you stated that some of those attending that meeting had not previously discussed the plan, but that for others, they must have heard the same explanations twice. Uh, and may I assume that you are referring in the latter group to the select group of CPK members? Yes, yes, that's right. And uh, within that select group, would there have been members of the central or standing committees? One would think so, but I have no direct evidence of that, of course. I'm now going to move to some specific um, uh, standing committee minutes that uh, were not included in uh, the book Pol Pot Plans the Future. The first is um, E stroke 217 or IS 13.10 Khmer uh, ERN 00007362 to 743, uh, English 00182635 to 2637, and French 00334964 to 4966. And that is, has the title of <coughs> a record of meeting of the Standing Committee 11 March 1976. The minutes disclose that it was uh, uh, 
attended by Nguyen Chia, Yang Sari, and Kir Sampan, uh, and that uh, at the meeting, problems with the Vietnamese on the eastern frontier were discussed, and the opinion of Angkor was given. Now, there are other similar documents, in particular E3-229, recording the minutes of the Standing Committee for the evening of 22 February 1976, a meeting uh, whose record also states that it was attended by the three accused and at which a report on the national defence situation was received and opinions and instructions given by Ankar. A further meeting of the Standing Committee held on the morning of 14 May 1976 with the uh, document number E3-2221 uh, also recorded the attendance of the three accused and considered a report on the sea borders and an, and an extended summary and direction was given by Pol Pot with brief commentary by Yang Sari. Now, I've summarized the minutes of three meetings very briefly. My question is, in the context of these meetings, did the word Ankar refer only to Pol Pot, or could it have a wider meaning and include other uh, CPK members as well? That's an <clears throat> excellent question. It's hard to answer. My first impulse is to think that uh, this is a document which had Pol Pot refer to himself as Ankar. But on second thought, <clears throat> it seems to me that the word in this context signifies that the decisions was made uh, at that meeting were made collectively by the organization itself. In other words, the people who were at the meeting. That makes more sense to me than having the meeting refer to Pol Pot as the organization because that, that just seems like a kind of hagiography that they didn't indulge in. But I have no direct evidence of that. Of course, I'm, I'm not, uh, it's just an assumption on my part. Uh, another document that I would like you to comment on is the record of a meeting of the Standing Committee on 26 March 1976. Uh, and the record states that this meeting was chaired by Nguyen Chia and attended by Kyo Sampan. The document number is E3-218. During that meeting, Ya gave an extensive report concerning negotiations with the Vietnamese concerning the eastern border. Uh, and in those minutes, Nguyen Chia, as Dep Deputy Secretary, is recorded as having given instructions and opinions on the negotiations with the Vietnamese, including orders about the use of mines, and that's found at English ERN 00182657. Uh, and as well, the sinking of some Vietnamese boats. Nguyen Chia is quoted in the minutes as saying, with Vietnam, our problems are never ending. We must combine the political struggle, the diplomatic struggle, and use military force in combination. Uh, does the record of this meeting uh, accord with the accused Nguyen Chia's assessment of himself as saying that politicians, of which he was one, held less power than the military? I think it somewhat contradicts that statement, frankly. In the closing order, uh, document number D427, English ERN 00604548249, Khmer 00605300 to 5302, and French 00624175 to 176. 
the co-investigating judges identified five policies that they said had been designed and implemented by the three accused, uh, as well as other CPK members. Those five policies were, first, repeated movement of the population from towns and cities to rural areas and from one rural area to another. Two, the establishment and operation of cooperatives and work sites. Three, the re-education of bad elements and the killing of enemies, both inside and outside the party ranks. Four, the targeting of specific groups, in particular the Cham, Vietnamese, Buddhists, and former officials of the Khmer Republic, including both civil servants and former military personnel. And the fifth policy is the regulation of marriage. Uh, based on your research, do you consider these to be among the more or less important policies uh, developed and pursued by the CPK? I think they represent some of the <clears throat> more important uh, policies. I would think uh, particularly the first three are crucial. The fourth and fifth seem to me less, uh, less crucial, but uh, still important. Are you able to say from your research when these policies, uh, the period over which these policies might have been developed, uh, and uh, by which organ of democratic Kampuchea, or by which particular person? I don't, think, <clears throat> I don't think any of these policies can be traced to a single person. Uh, the movement of people was decided on uh, <clears throat> uh, as, as a national policy in February of 75, but uh, several towns, including uh, Udong and Krache, had been evacuated previously, so it was a policy that had been tested. Similarly, the um, uh, opening of uh, cooperatives and so on had... Uh, been inaugurated in uh, so-called liberated territory in 73, particularly in the Southwest. Um, the <clears throat> going after uh, bad elements had always been a feature of uh, the uh, communist program, but I think it uh, didn't come into uh, we didn't come into uh, operation until the victory of uh, April 17th, when the uh, Lonnal uh, personnel were. Uh, uh, singled out. Um, then we get to uh, the, tar the, the targeting of specific uh, uh, sectors of the uh, country. I think the Vietnamese were probably targeted from the uh, from the beginning. Uh, the Cham and I'm, I'm a little confused about the uh, targeting of Buddhists. I think it must mean targeting of uh, Buddhists. Uh, I would think monks are people who are just trying to practice their religion. That term seems ambiguous to me in this context. But uh, the Cham uh, certainly were not targeted from the beginning if they were uh, systematically targeted. And finally, the uh, marriages, um, I'm not sure that that policy took effect before 1976, but I don't have evidence on that. So certainly the first, uh, the first two were inaugurated before 75. The third one uh, came into effect with the victory and the fourth and fifth came later, I would say, except perhaps for the targeting of Vietnamese, which began uh, very, very, very soon. Thank you. Uh, these uh, five policies to which I have referred would, uh, uh, based on your research again, of course, would they have been published broadly or explained to the general membership of the Communist Party of? Uh, Kampuchea or to the people of Cambodia as a whole? In reverse order, I mean, I guess to explain to the Cambodian people as a whole, this would have taken place, some of these uh, policies would have been explained at, at political meetings that were held um, in, in uh, districts and sectors and zones. But <clears throat> the, uh, 
They would not have been explained as policies of, of a ruling party. The party never identified itself as such to the people at large. Uh, members of the party would have been at various levels, would have been briefed in, in increasing uh, detail as they became higher in, uh, in rank and position. Uh, some of the uh, policies were explained in the party uh, magazine, Tung uh, de Wat, the uh, revolutionary flags. Uh, but this flow of information was very tightly uh, controlled by the regime and uh, very uh, access to there, there was no, let me put it another way, there was no discussion, no open discussion of these policies insofar as they were discussed at uh, high level meetings. We have very little uh, documentary evidence of those uh, discussions. But uh, these were, uh, for instance, I, I don't have high level uh, documentation for the policy of uh, the arranged uh, marriages. But uh, by and large, I think the leadership knew what it wanted to do. The next levels down uh, heard much of what the leadership wanted to do. And as it got further and further down, some of these policies became uh, not very clearly articulated, but uh, still uh, part of everyday life. Thank you. Well, finally, I, I would just like um, you to uh, elaborate on your last uh, answer. Um, uh, concerning communication of CPK policies. Uh, and you mentioned the Revolutionary Flag magazine. Uh, was that widely circulated uh, along with Revolutionary Youth magazines? No, access to those two journals was limited to uh, party members. And uh, I'm not sure that Every party member had his own copy, but certainly no one outside the party was given access to either of those journals. Yes, uh, thank you, Professor Chandler. President, I have no further questions at this time. Thank you, Judge. Now, pursuant to Rule 90 and 91 of the Internal Rules concerning the appointment of experts dated uh, July 2012, document E125, I now uh, turn over to the parties uh, to uh, proceed with the questioning. We have to begin with the prosecution. You may proceed. Mr. Chandrarasmi, good morning, Mr. President. Good morning, Your Honours. Good morning to everyone. Good morning, Professor Chandler. I am Chandrarasmi. I am the Deputy Co-Prosecutor. I have a few questions to uh, put to you, experts. Of course, uh, a number of questions has or have already been asked by the uh, bench, but I would uh, like to ask a further question to seek clarification on some of the points you testified earlier. I have to begin, first of all, with your university qualification. And um, you, can you confirm uh, that you uh, hold the following degrees? Uh, the first one being bachelor degree in English literature from Harvard University in 1954. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you. And then you also uh, graduated uh, uh, w with a master degree. Is that correct? Uh, <clears throat> yes, that was in Southeast Asian Studies at Yale University. Thank you. Can you please uh, confirm uh, that you were an honorary research associate in Monash 
Asia Institute at Monash University, Australia from 2004 to 2011. What was the subject of that research? Oh, it was no specific research. I think it was a more or less honorary position uh, from which I was able uh, technically to supervise some of the work of graduate students, uh, participate in seminars, and not to conduct any direct teaching, and it was unpaid. Uh, I conducted research on topics that interested me that uh, in that period, uh, but it was not directed by anyone to do towards specific topics. Thank you. Yes, now, uh, your honors, member of the bench, uh, ask you certain questions concerning your publication. And you mentioned that you uh, published some five uh, books. So uh, can you uh, clarify as to w what sources do you base uh, your research and writing on? Uh, <clears throat> oh, thank you. Uh, well, the mix, mixture of sources for each of those books that have been referred to in the court was very different. I mean, the uh, first one, I guess, I guess a book that's not referred to in the uh, court so far, My History of Cambodia, which first came out in 83, uh, that required a lot of work in uh, French archives, in Cambodian and uh, Thai archives, and in uh, American uh, Archives. I didn't do too many interviews for that book. Uh, second book, The uh, Pot Plans the Future, as we've come up before, the main research in that book was right inside those documents themselves, and any context we could add in the editorial, we did that as best we could. Uh, Pol Pot Plans the Future, no, I'm sorry, Brother Number One, uh, no, again, sorry, <laughs> Tragedy of Cambodian History, the next one, uh, that was a, a book that required a very wide range of sources from foreign uh, archives and uh, archives in France, America, Australia, Great Britain, uh, a little wide range of interviews, a large uh, work in secondary sources like newspapers and so on, uh, access to um, American diplomatic correspondence, and finally to over 100 interviews with people who had participated in the history of Cambodia in the period I was discussing, which is 1945 to 1979. It was my longest book, and it had the most widest range of sources. The book I was writing at the same time, uh, or working on at the same time, was uh, Brother Number One, which benefited from an overlap of sources with the other book, but also from a range of different interviews uh, with people who had some sort of uh, personal uh, knowledge of uh, Pol Pot himself or of his associates. And so that sources were different there. Uh, finally, uh, <clears throat> in uh, Voices from S21, uh, my main source was, of course, the uh, archival material emanating from S21 uh, facility, uh, but also uh, I included interviews with some former members of the uh, staff from some survivors. Uh, I used, uh, profited from the interviews that other people had done with uh, a variety of people concerned with that, uh, with that facility. And then, unlike my other sources, my other books, I was trying to uh, formulate a certain comparative uh, framework for my study of S21. So this led me to study a good many secondary sources concerned with uh, such things as the uh, Holocaust, uh, the uh, uh, Stalin's, Stalin's reforms in in uh, Ukraine, uh, the Indonesian uh, mass assassinations of communists in 1965-6, uh, some material on uh, Argentina, just on on the behavior of of, uh, of regimes uh, which. Uh, created a large number of deaths. So this comparative uh, sources, I hadn't, hadn't done that before. It was very interesting for me to do that, but that was a new kind of, of sourcing. And that's my, uh, that was my most, 
I guess it's probably my last book in both senses of the word, but certainly the most uh, where my primary research has so far stopped. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. I would like to now uh, seek a bit of clarification. Among the books you have written, did you conduct interview with the uh, Cambodian refugees at the Kawidang camp in Thailand? Yes, indeed. Uh, I was invited there by UNHCR in the autumn of 1984 to interview uh, Cambodian refugees who had been uh, singled out by other interviewing sources from the United States primarily as possibly uh, members of the Khmer Rouge and thus ineligible for uh, transfer to uh, a third country. Uh, I conducted about, oh, three or four, between three and 400 interviews at that time with uh, refugees trying to clarify some of their status, their life histories, and so forth. Uh, a very, uh, for me, a very exciting uh, uh, re-entry into the uh, pleasures of uh, speaking Khmer and of meeting uh, large numbers of uh, Khmer, which had not been possible for me uh, in the 1970s and early 1980s. I couldn't look. Thank you, Professor. The President, uh, I note the Defense Council is on his feet. You may proceed. Mr. Kung Sam On. Uh, my apology for interruption, Mr. President. I would like to ask the prosecutor to ask the question again because uh, he said uh, uh, the, the question from the prosecution was uh, that it uh, referred to 1994. I don't know whether or not uh, the, the answer was correct or it was the uh, error in translation. The President, uh, co-prosecutor, can you please uh, clarify the date you mentioned? Mr. Dararas May. Thank you, Mr. President. And I would like to inform my uh, colleague that I would like to ask the question that uh, of the uh, event that took place in 1984. And my question was mainly whether or not uh, the expert uh, had conducted interview with the refugee. Uh, Mr. President. Yes, of course, it was referred to 1984 because in, uh, in 1984, because 1994, all the refugees were repatriated to Cambodia already. Uh, Mr. Dararesme, I would like to now resume my question. Uh, Professor, can you uh, clarify uh, when you were conducting research on the history of the Communist Party of uh, Kampuchea or the uh, Democratic Kampuchea, uh, uh, what was your main theme of the research of the Communist Party of Cambodia and the Democratic Cambodia period? Um, I'm not sure that as an historian uh, I had a major theme. I was trying to build up a persuasive and uh, factually accurate, accurate uh, narrative of the uh, uh, years that the Khmer Rouge uh, were in power. <clears throat> My theme, I think, I guess, uh, whether I succeeded or not is for others to say, was to be as, as open and uh, fair to the evidence as I could be and to, to be as, uh, to consult as many uh, kinds of evidence as I could uh, to uh, widen my uh, understanding and to clarify facts. And this point, just a personal uh, footnote, uh, when I was writing those books in the late 1980s, I would certainly have been much happier had I had access to the material in the closing order because I've been reading material in the last couple of days that would have been just perfect to put into my books, but this material is not available to me. Um, so yeah, my theme was basically an historical one. In all those cases, biographical, of course, in the Paul Pot case, uh, the S21 book was not a narrative history, although there's a chapter that does deal with that. I was there trying to analyze the operations of an institution, which was a new kind of procedure for me, and uh, very difficult to write a book that did not uh, have a narrative format, but that was uh, part of the challenge. 
uh, and the theme always, I think, of all these books was to discover as best I could what had happened in these either periods of history or the lifespan of a single man or the operations of a single uh, institution. Thank you, uh, Professor. I move on to my next question. Uh, when did you start uh, studying uh, the, uh, about the Khmer Rouge and the Communist Party of Cambodia? And uh, what uh, did you consider the main uh, parts of your research? I started, uh, I guess, let me think, 1975, 76, I was uh, as baffled and confused as what was happening in Cambodia, as many other people were, both inside and outside the country. Um, I was curious about what was going on. Uh, I conducted some interviews with some refugees who had come to Australia. Uh, and could tell me a little bit about the regime. And I, I wrote some fairly tentative uh, articles trying to come to grips with what was uh, being, uh, what was going on. In uh, about 1976, 77, more material is coming clear. I uh, was still not writing as much on the Khmer Rouge as I probably should have done, maybe because it was still so uh, unclear to me what was actually going on. Uh, at a conference in uh, the first time I really started putting my mind to this material, as well as working very closely with uh, Ben Kiernan, who was my gra graduate student working under my supervision, was a conference that was held in uh, Chiang Mai, Thailand in 1981 that resulted in a book that Ben Kiernan and I edited called uh, uh, Revolution and Its Aftermath in Cambodia. This was a conference that drew together several people who were interested in Cambodia, resulted in a book, as I say. And <clears throat> from then on, I would say from 81 on, I concentrated almost all my research on uh, the Khmer Rouge period, uh, adding chapters to uh, books that uh, my history book would added a chapter to that one about uh, this period and so on. So I guess you could say my interest was sparked from the, really from April 75, if not somewhat before, uh, and then uh, research, serious research writing beginning in the early 1980s. Thank you, Professor. My next question. How long have you been studying the Khmer Rouge and the CPK? Well, as I, oh, sorry. Well, as I say, I think I've been concerned about them since uh, they came to power. Uh, I began writing about them in 76, 77, but not in great, great detail. And then from about 1981 on, uh, I would say almost all my research has been on the Khmer Rouge period. Thank you, Professor David Chandler. Now I would like to move on to the next topic on the Communist Party of Cambodia, particularly the statute of the CPKs. And I uh, would like uh, to ask uh, you a few questions according to your recollection. And I would also seek uh, permission from Mr. President. When I ask a question um, about the statute of the CPK, I would like to seek leave from the chamber to uh, display some of the documents in order to refresh Professor David Chandler's mem memory. 
My question, I would like to ask you to uh, recall uh, your memory concerning the uh, CPK statute, and I would like to uh, seek leave from Mr. President if I can uh, display this document uh, to the expert. The President, you may proceed. This document is the uh, statute of the CPK, uh, document E3-130. stroke And uh, Mr. Expert, uh, you may go through uh, this document briefly, and then I will put a question to you afterwards. My first question to you is, have you ever read this document before? I'm not certain that I have. It's not coming back to me clearly as I look at it. Uh, I must have done it at some stage, but I can't clearly recall that. I've read other uh, statute documents, but this particular one, I don't. Uh, it's not coming through, through clearly to me in my recollection, I'm sorry to say. <clears throat> Mr. David uh, Chandler, uh, the document you have before you is in English uh, language. Of course, uh, uh, it is also available in uh, the working languages of the court as well, the Khmer being the regional language of this uh, document, and would like to ask you to go through it, and I may put a question concerning this document. That's fine. Thank you. May I now put a question to you? Yes, of course. Thank you, Mr. David Chandler. My first question is, what is your understanding of the purpose of this statute? From what you understand, what is the purpose of this statute? Well, it's to set out uh, in uh, definitive, or you'd have to say temporarily definitive form, because the statutes were often revised, and the last uh, one is the one that's uh, considered authoritative, but to set forth the uh, ideas and organization and purposes of the Communist Party of Kampuchea as the governing party of democratic Kampuchea and as, a, as the uh, instrument of uh, the Cambodian Revolution. In your research, were you able to ascertain as to when the statute was first drafted and how it was drafted? I don't think I can from this particular document. I'd have to recheck uh, if I have referred to it before. Uh, I would tentatively date it to 76, but I wouldn't swear to that. There were other statutes beforehand. I, I'm not in a position to, to answer your question, I'm sorry to say. Oh, 
Kun Lord David. Uh, thank you, Mr. David Chandler. May I seek your permission, Mr. President, that I now move to the second paragraph of this statute, the year number in Khmer is 00442253, and the year in English 00184024. And the French EIN number is 00292916. And I seek your permission, Mr. President, to put this document onto the screen as well. The President, you may proceed. But the document to be displayed on the screen is in Khmer rather than the English or French because the hard copy in English has been submitted to Mr. Witness and from now on the document to be displayed on the screen shall be in the Khmer language and relevant parties have to be ready to submit the hard copy in English to this expert Prosecutor, thank you, Mr. President. I would like to quote a portion of this paragraph in order to refresh the memory of Mr. Chandler. In paragraph 2 of the Khmer version of this statute, it reads that the Communist Party of Kampuchea is a peasant's party after the party led and totally achieved the national democratic revolution from the 17 April 1975 the party continues to lead the socialist revolution and construct socialism in an absolute monopoly in every sector the party's nature is that of being the highest organization of the Kampuchean worker class, the most audacious and brave regular army, the supreme commander governing and administering all revolutionary work, remaining close to the popular masses. This is the end of the quote from the second paragraph of the statute. And my question to you are uh, as follows. But let me first check whether you have read this paragraph. Defense Counsel for Mr. Yang Sari. Mr. President, may I have the floor? The President. Uh, David Chandler, can you answer the prosecutor question whether you have read this portion? Because it appears that there may be a problem with the uh, documents that you read before and the one that is being shown to you now. Now, with regards to what the prosecutor has read out to you, the question is, have you read this portion? I am also concerned with the short time provided to you to read the whole document. But the question asked is directed to only the portion read out just now. Yes, I have read this portion of the document. President. Mr. Ang Odom, Defense Counsel for Mr. Ng Sri, you may proceed. Counsel, good morning, Mr. President, your honors, and parties, everyone in the public gallery. I have heard answers 
of this witness to two questions and if I'm not mistaken please correct me you have said that you have never read this document before and the second the answer to the second question is that you will not be able to elaborate as well as explain any further of this document may I seek your owner's guidance whether we should apply our practice whether we should withdraw the document presented to this expert the president thank you for your observation but you may be mistaken mr expert has said that he has read the statute of the communist party of Campuchia, but the document that he read is not the one that is being presented to him now it may be different in the forms but he has read the substance of the party's statutes that is why the last question asked by the prosecutor is that he has read the document being presented to him here the, the document that is being presented to him may have a different version from what he read before the national prosecutor may now continue his questions to witness prosecutor thank you mr president now the the my version will be displayed on the screen and i submit uh, the english versions to mr expert as you uh, guided uh, Mr. David Chandler has told the court that he has read this document and I will not put questions in relation to this and I will not put questions in relation to any documents that he has not read. My questions are as follows. Mr. Chandler, I have observed a number of terms just in this paragraph. The first one is that the party continues to lead the socialist revolution and constructs socialism in an absolute monopoly. And the party's nature is that of being the highest organization of the Cambodian worker class and as the supreme commander governing and administ administering all revolutionary work. Can you elaborate what this means from what you, you, you understand? It seems, uh, <clears throat> it seems fairly straightforward to me as a statement of uh, an authoritative statement issued by the uh, CPK that was at that point uh, ruling uh, Cambodia. This is why I, I, it has to be post-75 after my has totally achieved and so on. Uh, it's a statement saying that power really in Cambodia from now on, from the time this uh, statute is promulgated to, I guess, largely to party members, uh, that from now on the party has the, as it says, the monopoly on, uh, on social social and, and the monopoly ability to construct socialism in absolute monopoly in every sector uh, throughout the country so it's a fairly clear statement of, of a, uh, a, a, a a claim if you like uh, of from a position of authority uh, that this authority is uh, legit not only legitimate but is also uh, monopolistic it's the only power that will be permitted to uh, exist in uh, Revolutionary Cambodia. Thank you, Mr. Chandler. If possible, on the basis of your understanding and your research, 
can you explain further regarding a number of important terms? For example, is the term absolute monopoly. What do you understand about this term with regards to the purpose of the, uh, of the establishment of this statute? Well, I think it's uh, basically a uh, statement that <coughs> that should be clear. I, I think it's pretty self-evident that what this statute uh, will not welcome is any uh, challenges or uh, uh, changes or suggestions to anything in the statute. I mean, it has a monopoly not only on uh, a monopoly of the power in Cambodia, a monopoly over the control of information coming out from that power powerful body. So it's uh, in every sector. That's a very wide, uh, wide term. It's just not allowing any other uh, uh, any other form of power to be exercised inside the country. Saying that's just is not to be allowed. It's rather like saying I think that uh, that the Communist Party was going from then on to be the air that people uh, breathed, rather than a separate political body that had nothing to do with people's lives. Thank you, Mr. Chen. And as for the word, or the phrase rather, the highest organization, uh, what does it mean and who were the members of this organization? Well, again, this is a, a kind of an ambit claim that says uh, we are in charge, we have the power, we are the highest organization. The highest organization of the party, of course, is the uh, <clears throat> Standing Committee and Central Committee, the Secretary and the Deputy Secretary of the Communist Party, the people who are uh, running the country who are not specifically identified by name or even by position, but the highest officials in the party are the ones with the authority over the exercise of the uh, party's uh, activities in uh, Cambodia. Thank you. Can you also explain to us the role of the party within democratic Cambodia? Oh, I wish I could, really. I mean, it, it conceived itself, uh, or it, the, the kind of people who wrote, the, who wrote this kind of document conceived that this party would be absolute and unchallenged and uh, unambiguous and uh, identifiable to party members throughout the, uh, the uh, country. This would be uh, an unchallenged uh, and uh, definitive document that would say how things would operate under the party's uh, considered to be uh, enlightened uh, leadership. Of course, uh, how, your question, how the party operated, uh, when you start using a phrase like that, you're getting into uh, the real world rather than in the world of uh, these ambit claims of authority made by the party. Uh, I don't think any uh, political body has ever been able to act with the kind of absolute uh, unchallenged and un questioned and unambiguous uh, power that this paragraph we've been talking about uh, mentions. But in fact, this is not a document that is going to uh, admit uh, uh, nuance, uh, the, the faintest uh, chance of uh, error or the faintest chance that this setup of the party's absolute power in all spheres and all sectors uh, could be, uh, in any sense, uh, something that was not going to occur in the real world. In other words, it's not going to say, uh, make a difference between what's in the statute and what's happening. There should be no difference between these in their view. But of course, your question is, how did it operate? As soon as you get into that operations question, you're in to the whole uh, real history of uh, decay. That's a phenomenon that's uh, still evolving that I have no claim to any genuine authority about, but one that I think many people in this room have, uh, have studied with care and are still coming up with new ideas.
Thank you, Mr. President. I would like to seek your permission to the other part of this document, EAN in Khmer is 00442255. And the English EAN is 00184025. And the French EAN is 00292917. May I display this document on the screen? And then I will put questions to the expert. The President, you may proceed to display portions of the entire statute. So you may continue in this way. You have indicated clear, clearly the year and number that, is, that corresponds to the portion you intend to use. Prosecutor, thank you, Mr. President. I may now put questions to Mr. Chandler. In the next paragraph that I refer to, the word democratic centralism was used. That is in paragraph 6. From what you remember or from your research, what do you think the, uh, the meaning of this phrase is? Well, I think uh, it's certainly a contradiction in terms. There's nothing uh, widely uh, democratic about uh, the centralism that uh, characterized uh, this Communist Party and many other uh, parties throughout the world, except that uh, these parties uh, considered themselves to be the embodiment and uh, uh, embodiments and uh, of the popular will, the popular uh, uh, the, of the people themselves. They felt that the people were, or the demos, were speaking uh, that were, were being represented fairly and, uh, and uh, sincerely by the uh, centralized authority. Uh, this is something that, of course, uh, the central authority has to, uh, ha has, a, I guess, a right to say, but it, it's not something that uh, uh, makes, to my mind, that much sense. It's, it's just if they said, uh, according to the principle of centralism, that would instantly... Uh, Tar this regime with being a dictatorship, which they did not consider. They did not consider themselves to be a dictatorship. They felt this to be a collective leadership acting in the interests of uh, the worker peasant uh, sectors of Cambodian society and the revolutionary ideas of Marxism Leninism, as they mentioned on the first page. So <clears throat> they felt they were legitimate uh, representatives of democracy power of the people in a very centralized form. But it is a com it's a complicated term, and there are other scholars who have paid much more attention to it than I have, I must admit. The President, Council Canavas, you may proceed. Uh Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I understand we're dealing with an expert and a historian. Uh, some of the questions, at least the way they're phrased, seem to at least give the impression to the witness that is here to give a legal interpretation, which is something that obviously uh, no expert in a court, as far as I'm concerned, aware of, uh, is entitled to do. Uh, so perhaps uh, the gentleman could be reminded that he's here to give evidence as far as his understanding of the documents uh, based on his research, and perhaps the questions may be slightly uh, ratcheted or recalibrated to reflect that. Thank you. President, I thank you very much, Mr. Canovas, for your observations. And the Chamber would like to e inform the National Prosecutor that 
you try to rephrase your questions to be put to this expert we are not calling a historian to explain us every terminology we may not be able to accommodate this your question should be more general that can either capture the facts at S21 or the entire case file 002 we are dealing with more facts than those addressed in case 001 this has been indicated in the memorandum sent to the parties already so please be reminded of uh, the memorandum and be part of the ascertaining the truth as we are dealing with a prominent scholar and historian here Prosecutor, thank you Mr. President and I would also like to the president interrupt you have been informed by the chamber is the prosecutor so try to rephrase your questions we are not asking him to explain us terminologies Prosecutor, thank you, Mr. President. I will now move on to the next question. Mr. Chandler, another question touch upon, touches up ch upon Article 3 and EIN number in Khmer is 00442262, and the English EIN is 00184032. And the French year is zero zero two nine two nine two two. May I request that you read uh, this article before I put a question to you? Have you already read it? Uh, this is in uh, my document goes. <clears throat> one, two, paragraph one, paragraph two, paragraph four. You said paragraph three. This is on page one of the English version. Is that what you're talking about? What page of the English version are we talking about? I am some. I would like to clarify that the English year number is 00184032. It is on page 13 in the English version. Uh, Rather, it is on page 11, says the prosecutor. Can I now put questions to you? Mr. Chandler, my question is that can you, on the basis of your expert, as they, uh, uh, tell us about the members of the parties? When we talk about the democratic centralism, when it comes to the decision of the membership, 
of the party on the basis of the principle of democratic centralism. How was it done? Well, of course, <clears throat> I was never there to observe it, so I mean, I'm not sure, but the phrase here, to consider, discuss, and join in decision-making, uh, that sounds fine, but I think what's hinted at in this paragraph, and I, I take in what the uh, defense counsel has been saying, I'm not an expert in uh, political philosophy at all. I've worked on it, but I'm not an expert. It seems to me what they're saying is, but any uh, party affairs are not in the hands of all the members, but party affairs can be discussed by members uh, according to the principle of democratic centralism, which means in accordance with uh, directives and suggestions that have come down to them from above. I mean, this is my, my interpretation. Uh, it's, it, it's really not, I don't, don't think this this uh, quite, quite appealing, if you read it just uh, quickly, appealing uh, paragraph is meant to suggest that ordinary members can interfere with the administration of Cambodia when they feel, uh, you know, uh, that, that they have a right to do so. But, again, only, seems to be only the party members to start with are entitled to talk about party affairs. People who aren't in the party don't even know what these affairs are. So party members are, so that's, that's one level of discussion. And these discussions would then move up to the next level and some of the findings of the lower level would be discussed and discussed and passed on. It could well be that all these discussions would come to nothing when you get to the centralism part of the of the phrase. But it could also be that some of these decisions and thoughts would come up to the, oh, says the leadership. In that case, maybe we have to do some alterations. And the alterations, when they came down, would have the force of law, the force of, of that would be what, what happened. And if the discussions at the lower level were thrown out, the party people had to go along with that. That's it. We, we made our point. Now it's come down, it's gone. The, uh, uh, I'll tell an anecdote of, of the phrase, about the phrase democratic centralism perhaps would fit into this discussion. It was a Czechoslovakian joke in the 1970s. A son asked his father, what's democratic centralism? And the father said, I'll tell you, you go down in the courtyard of our apartment, stand there. The boy stood there. And the father spat out the window and hit the boy on the head. And the boy said, what? He said, now, you spit up. That's uh, a joke manufactured by people who were living in this kind of regime. That's the way they interpreted it. The people who didn't like it interpreted democratic centralism in that, in that fashion. Mr. President, if I may be heard, I didn't wish... The President. Yes, Council Canavas, you may proceed. Clearly, the gentleman uh, is not competent to discuss this particular document at least not in the way to answer the questions that are being posed. Uh, he's being asked to interpret. And again, once we saw, what, what we saw was a legal interpretation. And in my opinion, if you, if you look at the answer, it's based on a great deal of speculation. He's a historian. He's read documents. He can describe what he believes what was going on, de facto, as opposed to being asked as if he were a constitutional scholar to interpret uh, the statute and what it meant. Now, if, for instance, if I may assist the other side, if, for instance, they wish to read out a passage and say, de facto, is there any evidence that how this operated, I would not be on my feet. Then he could discuss, based on his knowledge of reading documents and uh, his interviews. But where he's being asked, to interpret a document as such. He's being asked to give an opinion as an expert, and he's engaging in a great deal of speculation. And what happens in Czechoslovakia or someplace else, I care not. How other, uh, other regimes operate, I care not. He's here to discuss matters uh, concerning uh, this particular country at a particular period of time. Thank you.
the President. Thank you. And the International Co Prosecutor, you may proceed. Mr. President, as, as this issue might come up um, uh, as we go along and in consultation with my colleague, I just wanted to give um, our position. Um, I think that the Professor's answer best illustrates the uh, probative value of his opinion. Uh, he wasn't speculating. He was, in fact, opining on how this particular principle uh, may have been implemented in practice. And he talked about uh, discussion and information flowing upwards, uh, then uh, party centre looking at uh, input and deciding and passing down those decisions as law. Um, of course, the professor is here to discuss uh, the history of Democratic Kampuchea and the CPK. He is opining on the CPK statute, um, and I think it is entirely within his expertise, and it is an appropriate uh, question to put to him. The President. We note uh, the observation by uh, the Defense Counsel for Insari, Mr. Uh, Michael Canvas, and we then ask the prosecutor to reframe uh, the question to make sure that the question is compatible with the expertise of the uh, witness, particularly the question should be within the confines of uh, K002-01. And the question should be clear and uh, we have already ruled on that uh, observation and as for the uh, reason objection by the defense uh, counsel, uh, it is not likely to be appropriate because any objection on particular question should uh, have been made uh, before uh, the witness uh, respond the, to the question. And uh, the objection should not be belated uh, when it comes to uh, objecting to the question asked. So that has been the practice uh, before the chamber concerning the examination of the expert witness. Parties may object to the question put by the other parties if they are of the opinion that uh, the question is not conducive to ascertaining the truth. And the chamber on that basis will uh, rule uh, whether or not uh, that question is allowed. And I believe that parties concerned uh, would be attentive to the question put by the parties and they follow the procedures applicable in Cambodia, particularly the Code of Criminal Procedure in relation to the objection to the question put by the parties. And it is the discretion of the chamber to decide on the case-by-case case, uh, basis on the question uh, posed by the uh, party and the objection raised by the other party. And the chamber also is uh, uh, ready to uh, intervene whenever the question is not appropriate, uh, but uh, we would like to remind parties that any objection must be raised in a timely manner. The time is now appropriate for lunch adjournment. The court will adjourn uh, for lunch until 1.30 this afternoon. And court officer, please facilitate the accommodation for the expert witness and please uh, have him back to this courtroom by 1.30. The International Defense Council for Nguyen Chia, you may proceed. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my client, Mr. Nguyen Chia, would like to follow the proceedings this afternoon from the holding cell, and we have prepared the waiver.
the president. Counsel, uh, can you tell the court uh, the reason why he waives his right not to be present directly in this courtroom uh, this afternoon? Mr. President, as has been the case uh, throughout these proceedings, uh, Mr. Nunchia has trouble concentrating, uh, paying attention in general to these proceedings, uh, has been feeling uh, unwell in the afternoons on most occasions, and uh, will, as always, attempt to follow the proceedings. Maybe it's good to, for the record, state uh, once more that, in fact, when he is in the holding cell, He's not always able to follow the proceedings. We have stopped informing the trial chamber of this event happening, but just for the record, Nguyen Chia is not always actively participating in the proceedings. If you um, want a medical reason for uh, his request at this stage, as always, it is his uh, inability to concentrate for longer times and his uh, inability to sit upright, he rather will uh, lay down on the bed that is provided for him downstairs. The President, having noted the request by Nguyen Chia through his defense counsel to follow the proceeding remotely through audiovisual means, and he has expressed that he waives his right not to be present directly in this courtroom due to his tiredness and concentration in the courtroom. The chamber grants the request uh, by Nguyen Chia that he uh, to be he is to be uh, to follow the proceeding from the holding cell downstairs, and we also note uh, that he has waived his right not to be present directly in this courtroom. And the chamber requires the the defense team for Nguyen Chia to submit immediately uh, his waiver with the uh, some print or signature of the accused Nguyen Chia. And AV assistant, please uh, connect the audiovisual equipment uh, for Mr. Nguyen Chia to follow the proceeding uh, for the remainder of the day. And the chamber takes this opportunity to note uh, to the defense Council for Nguyen Chia that now your request is uh, granted, but uh, we uh, advise uh, that you uh, consult with your uh, client uh, very clearly before making the submission, and uh, the reasons behind this request must be outlined very clearly as well so that it can uh, provide the basis for the uh, chamber to uh, rule upon and the chamber will have to look at uh, the uh, reasons uh, very closely for your request. Court officers, uh, security guards are now instructed uh, to bring the accused 
to the holding cell downstairs, and Mr. Nguyen Chia is to remain in the holding cell this afternoon, where audiovisual equipment is uh, connected for him to follow the proceeding for the remainder of the day, and Mr. Kiu Sampon is to be brought into this courtroom before 1.30. The court is now adjourned. Greffier, all rise. <laughs>